Yeah, so indeed, I make it 5.30 now. Um, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm Chris Parks. I'll be your session chair for this afternoon. Uh, so many thanks to everyone for coming along. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to be discussing uh, primarily um, future colliders. Uh, we'll start with some uh, detector aspects, and then we'll discuss some physics aspects. And then at the end of the session, we'll also have a presentation on uh, Hyper-K. Um, so if uh, you want to share your slides, um, Maxim, um, and you can go ahead with the first presentation, and I will try to um, tell you um, five minutes from the end um, uh, when uh, you should be coming towards the close of your presentation. Perfect. Can you hear me? Can you see my slides? I can, and they're full screen as well now. So thanks very much. Please feel free to go ahead. Okay. Okay. Okay, Chris, thank you very much. And uh, within the next 15 to 20 minutes, I would like to tell you new ideas on the detector technology for the LC experiment of the, on behalf of the LC international development team. Of course, there is a, a lot of developments ongoing for the match technology and also the new developments. So I will try to give you just a snapshot of the activities. And I put a lot of the technical information on the slides for you uh, to get more information uh, after this talk. So basically, since more than 30 years, there are many forms of different linear collider RNT activities existing, which includes both uh, contribution within the large collaborations such as CALIS, LCTPC, FCAL. There is a many different efforts of the vertex detector RND as well as the individual RND groups. And actually, there is also many of the RND efforts which is ongoing, which is not currently included to be in the part of the concept group for the LC or click experiments, but which can become relevant in the future. And actually, the first point to give you the snapshot, I would like to refer you to the so called detector linear collider detector RND liaison document, which was actually released final version last February. At the end of the mandate of the LCC Physics and Detector Executive Board. It actually provides a concise summary and updates in the ILC TDR and CLIC CDR for different detector RD technologies, not for the concepts. The idea of this document is to summarize, uh, publicize the particular technologies and provide an update of regular RD efforts in order to provide an entry point for the new group to learn them about the current landscape of their RD activities, which is ongoing for since more than 30 years. Still, I mean, as I mentioned, this is a, just a snapshot of the different technologies, so no specific choices or preference of one technology or the other is addressed in this document. It rather provides a landscape. And in addition to the older technologies, uh, ILC community had an ILCX workshop in October last year, and there was a, some new emerging ideas of the new concepts were presented in these workshops, and actually I will go through some of these ideas in my presentation. As you know, in ILC, it is considered the two detector will operate in push-pull option, one of the international large detector, another the silicon detector. And actually, the two recent updates of the detector concept you can find according to these links for the ID interim design report and SAD design update. So basically, it provides a more recent review of the detector concept, in particular, the LD collaborations went in optimizing the detectors in the larger and smaller options options and uh, the parameters in all these uh, detectors is given actually in this table. But the key elements that ILD and SID tracking provides the two complementary approaches. While D will consist from silicon and gaseous detectors tracking the SID of the silicon tracking, it provides a complementarity in vertexing where the LD uses three double layers of pixels while SID uses a uh, five shot layers of barrels. In tracking, in case of the LD, it consists from the silicon tracker and time projection chamber, who actually provides a large number of measurements points per track and also D over DX information for particle ID, which is important for the LC, why the silicon tracker provides you a fewer tense but more precise hits points. And of course, the key elements for the precision at the ILC is um, uh, precision in, in uh, resolution, momentum resolution, and special resolution, and this strongly depends from the material budget. Since th these two concepts should not be considered as a final choice, of course, there is still a lot of opportunities in the LD and SID optimizations and in the technology options. The vertex detector RD is probably one of the most active 
uh, fields which relies for more than 30 years on different R&D activities. And LC relies on the low duty cycle, which allows you the trigger release readout and power pulsing. There are two different readout strategies, which include the readout from the silicon vertex detector continuous during the train without with power cycling or delayed after the train. And the media technology, which has been advanced since uh, more than 20 years, is a CMOS technology, depth at Chrono Peaks, Fine Peaks, SOI, and 3D, 3D integrations with uh, all the pro and contra in terms of special resolution and in terms of power consumptions. But sensor contribution, uh, many of the R&D activities which has been focused on the sensor design. And actually, the sensor design in terms of material contributes of the order of 20%, and the majority of the material sits in cable cooling and support. So the, among the LC challenges, which is related to the beam background, is actually and material budget needs to be addressed by the emerging R&D. And actually, phase integration and X0 reduction is of a primary importance. And actually, this work can be complementary to the one which is done in the experiment analyst studies on the captain support structures of band sensors. Actually, the development of the CMOS technology is pretty much driven now by the ALICE IT ts 3 upgrades, where the 100 nanometer CMOS technology is pretty much validated by the Alpide and Mimosis uh, CMOS sensors, which is developed for the ALICE and MVDD. But in addition, at the upgrade, the ALICE has a very ambitious program considering the band and silicon map sensors, actually, which provide you a truly cylindrical uh, tracking system with supportless. And in, in addition to this, to the industrial stitching, which could allow to cover the light area for low mass detectors, where you combine the several reticles from the same wafer. And submission of one of these uh, chips uh, is being expected in first quarter of the 2022. In the silicon tracking, I mean, it both refers to the LD and SID concepts. There is not much development work recently has been done with the baseline solution consisting of silicon microstrip tracking, but also some of the uh, enabling technology, LGAT concept, starts to be more and more developed. One of the key elements, of course, of the LGAT concept is timing. And we know that Ali Atlas and CMS upgrades include several meters of the LGAT sensors, which actually provides both the high precision tracking and high precision timing. And there, there, is, there is different concepts which is currently being evaluated, standard AC couple, trench, deep junction, and also inverse LGATs, which provides you a better field factor. In addition to this, uh, I mean, the redoubt ASIC may limit the intrinsic sensor performance. And here, in addition to power pulsing, one might need in the tracking system to use microchannel cooling to complement and to minimize the energy consumptions. And some of the examples is coming from implementing the microchannel cooling with multi CMOS sensors. And of course, the enormous achievement is development of LHC develop with the microchannel cooling. The recent paper here is uh, present. In terms of SID, ALD, as I mentioned already, the silicon tracking is complemented by gaseous tracking, TPC, with the MPGD readout, which significantly reduces E over B effects. And here the three MPGD options being considered, such as GEM, Micromegas, or integrated readout of the Micromegas with the time peak CMOS chips. And all of the technology has actually demonstrated the necessary single point resolution. And actually, the D over DX resolution, which is achieved with the TPC with this readout, is approaches 4%. And here is very important where I would like to emphasize the added value of timing for the LC. Because if you combine, for example, the over DX information with time of flight measurements based on the silicon tungsten and cal, you can provide a K, K, Kion's particle identification up to 10 GV, which is a very important. Still, in order to minimize the distortions due to the ion feedback, the LC might require a gating scheme. And here, a very interesting gating scheme based on large aperture gem is being studied but needs to be implemented in the prototype. Also, the possibility of reading out the TPC using the time peaks chips, grid peak structures, the so-called grid peak structure based on combination of gas detector for CMOS readout is becoming realistic. And it's not anymore is based on a few chips, but you can see a very large assembly of approximately 150 chips has been established from Ingrid's and were tested in the LCTPC prototype and DESI modules. And actually the quark board developed by 
Nikev based on, based on time peak three chips as a building block has been studied last summer in the DESI test beam. Uh, moving from the uh, gaseous detector to colorimetry, I, I don't need to tell you that the majority of the work has been done by the CALIS collaboration, which is for the development of the finest segmented and imaging colorimetry, which is originally where focused on the LC, but now is widened to include all possible of imaging colorimetries. And an example of picking up a GCAL high granularity colorimeter by the CMS phase two upgrades is one of the proof of this concept. And actually, in the colorimetry, there is a many different R&D lines which is ongoing, which is based both on the mat mature concept and also advanced ideas which has been presented at the LCX workshops. Of course, the matured concepts is both silicon tungsten and scintillating tungsten colorimeters, analog uh, colorimeters, uh, hadronic colorimeter, which is based uh, on a similar technology of the scintillating tungsten, and the digital or semi-digital hadronic colorimeters. And here you one can rely on the more than 20 years of work, which is basically uh, almost ready this technology for production of large scale prototypes and is ready for prepare of the, for the quick realization of four to five years to the real detector. In addition to this, there is a more new or refurbished, I would say, old ideas which is being discussed, such as the possibility of the CMOS map sensors in the ECAL dual readout colorimetry or replacing the first layer of the ECAL with L-guide sensors. And here, of course, one still needs to investigate the additional physics impact on the LC experiments and intensive R&D efforts is needed to realize it as a real detectors. As I already mentioned, many of these concepts, such as the silicon tungsten ECAL, scintillated tungsten ECAL, or uh, uh, analog hadronic colorimeter or digital hadronic colorimeter, has, the development has been started since the beginning of the century. And the proof of principle of physics prototypes was established. And moreover, the scalability of these prototypes was approved with the second generation of detector, which includes all of the aspects, including the engineering ones, such as the power pulse and mechanical design, embedded electronics, assembly calibration, and approach. What is also important that the current CALIS prototypes which were built is also provides an unprecedented granularity and cell by cell nanosecond timing information for validation of hadronic model on different readout technologies, which actually allows to improve the giant simulation. And recently there was a combined test beam with the analog HCAL with the CMS HCAL, and actually it allows the measurements of the evolution of hadronic showers in the time domain with the precision below 100 picoseconds. Of course, with the timing information, it opens the way to the 5D colorimetry where you measure the special position of the shower energy times. And actually the impact of the 5D colorimetry needs to be more deeply evaluated for the future LC developments. Because, I mean, it, it pretty much depends from the real goals and the physics wise. Of course, the timing will help with the mitigation of pileup. It can provide the support for the full 5D particle flow, but what is the precision in timing still to be uncharted territory, which needs to be investigated. The colorimeter with time of flight functionality in the first layers can be actually used to improve the PID. And here you can see some R&D tests, an example where one can replace a part of the ECAL with the LGAT sensors for the uh, of the order of 10 to 20 picosecond timing measurements, which was done by the Japanese groups. And actually, if you have a 20 picosecond timing measurements per heat, it can allow you to separate together with DO over DX pions from cans from protons up to 5 to 10 GeV, which is actually maximum momentum pretty much for most of the particles for the energy to 150 GeV. And of course, the time and information doesn't come for free. It trade off between the power consumption and timing capabilities. It can generate higher noise and timing and colorimetries can rely on the intelligent reconstruction using hundreds of heats in, in contrary to the single heat, for example, for meats. And in addition, it can help to distinguish particle types, which can be usable for flavor tagging, long click searches, and here's sigma energy resolution. Of course, the key element of the timing 
EZ value of timing is recognized in all of the LC concepts and the R&D line, which is ongoing. However, the gain in scientific return of the complete analysis still needs to be uh, quantified, in particular for tracking PID, for calorimetry PID, for the shower development, and for the common development. One of the ideas which actually was picked up originally by the LC experiments and become more relevant more and more is the possibility to use MAP sensor in the calorimetry. And here there is a synergy between LC detector R&D and Alice Focal developments. And Alice Focal has a test beam with the 24 Mimosa CMOS sensors with the silicon tungsten step. And actually, this can also can be the unique tool to improve shower resolutions. And there is a ongoing developments and plan to produce some R&D tests for this MAPS ECAL, for this SID concept where the MAPS is developed both for the calorimetry common design and for the trackers. And this is a common work which is with San ongoing. Another point which is being developed, and this is also not new one, but emerging one, is related to dual readout calorimetry. There was a lot of the extensive R&D work done by the DREAM RD52 collaborations, but in particular, the things became more interactive with the introduction of the CPM, which allows for better separation of the Charing Connors insulation lights. And several ideas have been presented at the LCX workshop, including the redoubt detector developments. Uh, the four-wall calorimetry is very important for the luminosity measurements and for the instantaneous luminosity management of beam feedback. Here, the beam cal, beam cal uh, needs to be operated in a very high radiation loads and different sensors like Gallimore, Sinaitis, SVD, Sapphire is being developed. And of course, the key element is the development of the ultra high compact lumic calorimeter, which can be installed very close to the beam pipe. And this is realized on extensive test beam campaign. Last but not least, I would like to mention about muon detector system, which actually didn't get a particular intention in particular because there is no significant challenges in terms of particle fluxes and radiation environments. The basic options being proposed post insulating strips with the CAPM readout. The RPC is possible. The newer types of MPGD detector is possible, but there is no much active work in this R&D because, as I mentioned, it's pretty much the challenges in terms of the array is not, uh, is not significant. Last but not least, going to the few words about the LC project itself. As you might know, there was established the international development team in August 2020 with the idea to the establish the pre-laboratory, which can be a way uh, the first pass towards the LC laboratory. And actually, this pre-laboratory would, would, would have some preliminary, some initial resources in order to complete the R&D activities, which might be ready to start the, the pre-lab. Three working groups have been established for the pre-lab setup, governance for the accelerator and physics detector, and pre-lab proposal has been published last June. And this graph shows a little bit more complicated slides, but uh, I just would like to put you a few key elements. So the goal of the in international development team within the next two years to set up the pre-lab, which will run for four to five years at a time where the full-scale government negotiations can continue in order to start the production towards 2030. Thank you very much. Many thanks indeed, Maxim. Um, are there uh, any uh, questions for this presentation? Um, maybe I can start off, Maxim, since you show a slide at the end about the um, political um, uh, scope and situation. Um, could you say a few words about where the negotiations are with Japan? I see your slide has, um, has an arrow for a statement by Japan already in February 2020. Well, this is actually true. Uh, the complicated the situation in Japan now ongoing. Uh, one of the discussions which is being established how to properly set up the prelab. Uh, because this is actually the chicken and egg problem within the governments to start this process because uh, uh, the initial uh, the foreign governments would not say anything positive be before Japan would be ready some uh, to ready to express some intention in order to proceed to the prelapse state. So at this point of time, there is ongoing discussion within the next advisory panel which actually will evaluate the LC process during the last three years. 
And based on this uh, panel discussion, uh, the Japanese government would decide actually uh, in order to go with the funding of the prelab activities, or they would decide that this is not appropriate point of time. The funding of the prelab activities is not only important from the perspective of the funding itself, which can allow to progress with the accelerator in the technology, but rather as a message to the European governments. So this is what is currently being anticipated as a first step. But what we are discussing, this is based on the so-called bottom-up approach, where the discussions is ongoing within the scientific community and the scientific community addressing together with the Ministry of Research. In addition to this, this project has a significant political component and was a com a complemented by the top-down approach, where the politicians also consider to express interest in the project. Last year, there have been government uh, elections. You know that Japan has a new prime minister since uh, Japan. And actually, now there is a some rearrangement in the government. This is why some of the top-down political activities would need to wait for a couple of months because before the structure of the new political sector is being established. So the things is quite uncertain. I would be very fair at this point of time. The next report is imminent at coming three months. And in a few months from now, we expect that the structure of the political sector would be better established after the elections. And then we have to see to which landscape we would arrive at this point of time. In the meantime, the discussion at the government level between uh, Japan, US, France, Germany, and UK took place in October last year. But of course, the European governments were making a clear message that without the clear message from Japan, uh, none of the uh, European governments would be able to say something positive in this direction. All right, it was a very interesting discussion. Thanks very much, Maxim. Um, uh, um, I don't see any other immediate questions. So maybe I can ask one more, I'm turning more to the science side. Um, um, you um, presented earlier in your talk about um, uh, the application of maps, um, uh, actually in the tracking, I meant well, that you also discussed them for uh, for the ECAL as well. Um, uh, in terms of the um, radiation levels and the data rate, um, are these already reasonably proven with uh, the existing um, maps developments um, for the for the LHC experiments, for, uh, for example, or, or are there further improvements required for the ILC? Well, uh, to my understanding, the um, Alice Focal the rates in the ILC, I have to check in the rates, but Alice Focal would be a very nice bench uh, for because the rates in the ILD layers, uh, the first layers of ILD is not expected more than Alice Focal. Now, coming back to maps, I would say there was a significant progress in CMOS sensor, which is done in particular for the Alpi which is basically, and while the original maps, uh, I wouldn't be so confident that in the first layers of colorimetry, this would be fine. I would say for the Alpide, to my first opinion, but I have to check, it should be sufficient from this point of view. For the data rates, uh, I, would not, I would not expect any problem. Okay, all right, that's very interesting. Um, and, and what sort of time resolution in general would one be uh, if one wants wants to add precision time information, which of course is that the, the uh, there's a lot of emphasis at at the LHC at the moment um, for future upgrades. Um, uh, what sort of time resolution would be useful at the ILC? I'm less familiar with what the beam structure is like at the ILC. Well, uh, basically, uh, thanks to the fine granularity, I need the timing information is really needed in case of ILD for the PID, because in particular for the vertex detector for maps, it yeah. depends for the ILD, the time stamping is desirable, but actually not even needed. For the SID, because of the smaller number of points, you must need a time stamping. But this time stamping would be needed in the area of the microseconds, maybe. Ah. Wow, okay. Th this, this, this type of thing. So basically okay. for, the, for the vertex detector, you would need a microsecond type stamp okay. and this might be sufficient. The key elements actually is that you would like to keep a silicon detector without active cooling. 
And this is one of the key elements because you really want to reach a three microns resolution. And if you go to the, to the precise time in this do, what you actually profit, and when we discuss like an LHC case, this is maybe some of the LGATs in the calorimetry where you provide the PID, but certainly in not in order to resolve because it still remains a clean environment despite of the beam background effects. Many thanks, uh, understood. Okay, uh, if there are no further questions for Maxim, we should probably move on. So many thanks again. Thank you. Uh, uh, and our next presentation is going to be given by uh, Jan Klamka, who's going to talk to us about um, prospects um, uh, for charged IDM scalars at uh, Click. Okay, hello, can you hear me? We can and see you fine. Great, uh, I will try to show my slides. Hello, uh, have we lost Jan? Hello, can anyone else hear me? It's, yes, we've lost Jan. Okay, okay, so it looks like we've lost Jan for a moment. I hope you can ah, perfect. See, hear me again, back, sorry. Yeah. I was for some reason disconnected. No problem, do you wanna try and share your slides? Yes. Can you see them? Uh, we can. That's perfect. Uh, if you want to make them full screen, that's perfect now. And I'll try and warn you um, five minutes before the end of the presentation. Great. Thanks. Uh, so hello, everyone, again. Uh, I would like to show you the results of our study about the possibility of detecting the charge scalars from the inner tablet model at high energy, uh, energy stages of uh, click. So let me start with a short introduction about the compact linear collider. Uh, it is a concept uh, of a future Higgs factory, and it incorporates a novel two-beam acceleration uh, technique based on the uh, drive beams that provide uh, RF power to the main linac. This is a normal conducting technology, so it can operate in a room temperature, and it uh, provides a high uh, gradient of 100 MeV per meter uh, using 12 gigahertz accelerating structures. Uh, uh, the plus minus 80 percent polarization of the electron beam is possible and uh, the implementation assumes three stages uh, first at 380 GeV uh, central mass collision energy and the next to at 1.5 and uh, 3 TeV. There is also a dedicated uh, detector concept uh, for click the so-called click that uh, and it is optimized for uh, particle flow approach uh, and uh, because we are talking, of course, about the Higgs factory. The main focus uh, will be the uh, Higgs uh, precision measurements, especially at the first uh, running stage. But uh, we can do also uh, precision uh, top quark measurements, including the top threshold scan. And the next to uh, the high energy stages, uh, open access to Higgs self coupling and the top Yukawa coupling, uh, but also to many more uh, precision measurements via the indirect BSM constraints. Uh, but of course, these two high energy stages offer a great uh, possibility of uh, probing the, the new physics directly. And uh, today I'm going to talk, talk to you about the possibility of detecting uh, scalars from the inner doublet model. This is just a simple extension uh, of the standard model scalar sector, or besides a uh, standard fixed doublet, we have uh, an additional, the so-called inert or dark doublet. Uh, with four new scalar fields, uh, two neutral and uh, two charged, and that thanks to the additional Z2 symmetry do not couple to uh, the uh, standard model fermions. And also due to this, this uh, additional symmetry, the lightest of them, this uh, neutral edge, is stable, what makes it a very good dark matter candidate. Um, another good thing about this model is uh, it's, is its simplicity, uh, because after fixing the, uh, the standard model, uh, parameters, we are left with only five free parameters, uh, and we have already some existing uh, constraints on this uh, parameter space, uh, both theoretical and experimental. Uh, we considered 23 benchmark points in this parameter space with the high masses of, uh, of the inert scalars, and uh, these were selected from the scan uh, in this paper uh, for the two production scenarios in uh, the lepton colliders one neutral production channel and one uh, charged uh, channel 
you can see the benchmark points at the bottom of the slide uh, on the left on the plane of the masses of the uh, of the new scalars and on the right on the plane of the mass splittings. Uh, the yellow uh, points show the scan and the blue and the selected uh, benchmark points. Uh, the important thing to note here is that uh, we have several benchmark points here in this region of uh, small mass splittings. Uh, so, for example, when uh, the mass splitting between those two scalars is small, we will have this uh, gauge boson. It can be uh, far off shell, and this will be important later. Uh, so there was a, a previous analysis uh, about this model at click uh, conducted in the fully electronic final state on the generator level uh, with uh, the cuts reflecting detector acceptance. Uh, this study is described here uh, in this publication. Uh, and uh, here you can see the results of this, uh, of this analysis. So the expected significances uh, of the deviation from the standard model background uh, for different uh, benchmark scenarios. Uh, at, uh, at, the, at, at each uh, click uh, running stage. Uh, and on the left is a function of the, uh, of the masses of the neutral scalars and on the right uh, as a function of the masses of the charged uh, heavy Higgs. Uh, and what you can see here is that the discovery reach is unfor unfortunately limited in this channel. Uh, for, the, uh, for the neutral uh, channel production channel uh, up to the uh, masses of uh, 250 GV and in the charge channel up to masses of 500 GV. Uh, so this is why uh, we consider the high energy stages and only masses uh, of uh, only high masses uh, of, the, of the inner scalars. And also for this reason, and now we are taking a different approach. Uh, we, uh, we consider the semi-leptonic final state, uh, which offers uh, one order of magnitude higher cross section, uh, but it's only possible in this uh, charged uh, production channel. Uh, so the expected signature will be uh, the one lepton, electro muon, and the pair of jets. And for the analysis, we use simple cut based pre selection followed by a multivariate analysis based on the boost decision trees. Uh, we use click beam spectra for 1.5 and 3 TeV, assuming total integrated luminosity of uh, 2 and 4 inverse atom burns, respectively. And uh, the samples were generated with wizard 2.7. Uh, and for the detector response uh, simulation, we used for five selected scenarios the uh, full simulation based on the Jean, uh, Jean 4. Uh, and then the analysis was extended to the full set of uh, 23 benchmark scenarios considered in the analysis, uh, and uh, for that we used fast simulation methods. Uh, here I would like to show you the distributions of the kinematic variables, uh, the digit uh, mass on the left and digit energy on the right. Uh, the black histogram shows the sum of the standard model backgrounds, uh, and uh, the blue and red histograms correspond to uh, the two selected uh, signal scenarios. Uh, the blue one uh, in the blue scenario, uh, the produce W is on shell. Uh, uh, it is real, and uh, in the red scenario, the mass spectrum is very small, and uh, and the W boson is highly virtual. So what you can see here is that uh, there is a huge uh, a huge difference between uh, the shapes of those uh, uh, of those uh, distributions. Uh, so there, there is a. In, this is just an example, but but, but there is a, there is a huge difference between those two types of of scenarios, uh, and we will have to treat them separately. Also, this uh, justifies why uh, we choose uh, a wide range of mass splittings uh, for the five scenario, scenarios used uh, in the full simulation analysis. And these are the results of this uh, of this analysis based on full simulation. And so the expected significances uh, as a function on the left on the left uh, of the two masses of the to total uh, of the masses of the total produced uh, charged ADM scalars and on the right is a function of the uh, scalar mass splittings for different uh, benchmark scenarios. Uh, what you can see here is that uh, all of the considered uh, scenarios here for, for all of them at, at both energy stages, the ADM scalars could be discovered, uh, the significance is over uh, five sigma shown with the uh, red horizontal line, uh, but for now the selection was optimized for uh, each uh, particular uh, scenario. Uh, so now 
we extend the analysis uh, to the full set of scenarios uh, using uh, Delphast fast simulation. But there is uh, also uh, one important thing uh, I have to tell you, uh, namely uh, uh, about the, the beam induced backgrounds uh, in this in this analysis, uh, because at Click we have uh, very high beam intensity and uh, high bunch collision rate, uh, which results in, in very huge beam induced backgrounds. And from the physics and, and performance point of view, the most important are the soft gamma gamma collisions uh, producing hadrons. Uh, and I'm, I'm telling you this because, uh, as I said already, uh, we have those scenarios with uh, highly virtual Ws, which decay into quite soft final states. Uh, the, the reconstruction of which can be uh, can be highly influenced by um, by these gamma gamma hadrons uh, background, the so-called the so-called overlay events. The standard way to mitigate this background click is to use uh, the cuts on the timestamps of reconstructed particle flow objects. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we don't have those cuts uh, in the CLIDET uh, model uh, for Delphus. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have to we have to include this background. So uh, so we do this in an approximate way using uh, using cuts uh, on on the generator level in the gamma gamma hadron samples. Uh, and this is uh, these are the results of this of this approach. Uh, so you can see here the distributions of the digit mass on the left uh, for the standard model background with the QQ in your final state, and on the right uh, for one of the signal scenarios with very small uh, mass splitting. Uh, and the red histogram shows the full simulation. Uh, the light blue uh, results from from Delphus simulation with just default uh, default setup. And dark blue histogram uh, results from Delphes with uh, included overlay with our approximate approach. So what you can see here is uh, that uh, the Delphes with uh, overlay events uh, included uh, is uh, is much more realistic. Uh, it's, it is much more similar to the full simulation, especially in this region of uh, in these regions of of peaks. Uh, this is also the influence of the of the gamma gamma to hadrons uh, events contribution on the final results on the expected significances uh, shown here again as a function of two masses of the uh, charge scalar uh, with the red, red circles uh, these are the uh, the same results as previously for the full simulation uh, and green dots uh, show uh, the results from Delphus with uh, overlay background included. And as you can see, they're much closer to the uh, full simulation compared to uh, just pure Delphus uh, shown with uh, the, uh, these uh, blue crosses. Uh, one more comparison of the results. Uh, here there are the differences between uh, significance obtained with uh, fast and full simulation. Uh, the empty circles uh, correspond to just uh, default Delphus. And uh, the, these uh, full dots uh, correspond to Delphus with uh, gamma gamma hadrons events included. Uh, so what you can see here is that we were able to strongly dis reduce these uh, discrepancies between uh, fast and full simulation. Uh, but also uh, you can uh, note here that there was a, a clear dependence of these uh, of these discrepancies on the on the scalar mass things. And we were also, of course, this dependence is, is still there. Uh, but uh, but it is much weaker now after including uh, the overlay events in that. Uh, so finally, you can see here the full set of results uh, based on Delphus with, uh, of course, contribution of the overlay events. Uh, and uh, but now uh, the boosted decision trees, uh, uh, the selection was not not uh, optimized to the particular scenario. The boosted decision trees were trained uh, on the two data sets uh, separately. One data set composed of the scenarios uh, with uh, off-shell W boson production and the another data set composed of uh, scenarios with real Ws. Uh, and you can see here that uh, actually for a uh, vast majority of the benchmark scenarios considered, uh, we could uh, observe the IDM scalars uh, and also that uh, on the right plot, uh, where the results as a function of the mass clipping is shown, uh, that in fact those uh, those uh, scenarios with small mass splittings are the most challenging uh, due to the overlay contribution. 
So this brings me to my conclusions. Uh, we analyzed the prospects for uh, observing the charged IDM uh, scalars at uh, high energy stages of click. And for that, we used uh, both uh, full and fast simulation methods. Uh, and it turns out that, uh, that the, the influence of the gamma gamma hadron Hadron's overlay events uh, are crucial for this analysis. Uh, so we developed a method to, to include this in this background uh, in the click death model for Delphas. Uh, and it shows uh, much more uh, realistic predictions than just uh, uh, default Delphas. Uh, and the final conclusion is that uh, the charged IDM scalars could be observed at click uh, for even for masses up to one TeV. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, many thanks, Jan. Um, and uh, do we have any uh, questions for Jan's presentation? Uh, can I ask Jan, has this model been searched for at, um, at the LHC? Uh, I don't recall any, any, uh, uh, any, any searches. I mean, uh, I think they were this this model was recommended by the dark matter group, uh, but I don't know if there are uh, some uh, some results already. Okay, uh, I, I don't remember. Uh, let's move to Marco. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks very much for the nice talk. Um, you uh, spoke here about an analysis aimed at uh, a click. Now we don't know exactly what accelerator we will have in the future. So can you uh, comment on, on how this might translate to, uh, to, to other E plus E minus uh, uh, colliders? Uh, but you mean uh, dark? Uh, circular. Uh, okay. ILC will, will uh, possibly be too, too low in mm -hmm. energy. Yeah, but you mean uh, like uh, direct uh, translation of those results or or do well, the, you... the, the, the physics potential of, of what you've uh, what you've discussed uh, I mean is, is there is there a, a specific advantage in, in, in doing this this search uh, at at click um, so yeah um, the those results mainly depend on uh, I mean the, the the expected significance uh, here uh, you can see that there is some dependence on the on the mass right but in fact this is dependence on the cross section which which depends on the mass uh, so of course uh, it it all depends on the uh, on the kinematic uh, reach of the of the future collider uh, so uh, the ilc could be uh, up, could prop only scales up to 250 gv right uh, the the FCC even 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 lighter, uh, but ILC could have an advantage that uh, it it has much lower abundance backgrounds, uh, which could uh, increase the the reconstruction in this region of small uh, mass spectrums, right? So this could be advantage of the uh, ILC. But on the other hand, uh, you have uh, you have the, this smaller kinematic reach. Many thanks, okay. and we'll take a final question from Tanya. Yeah, sorry. Um, it's more a comment to uh, more or less actually both uh, questions. So the first question for the LHC, <clears throat> because I was an author of this benchmark setup. So, uh, okay. Um, so for the LHC so far, there has been no uh, study for this model, designated study for this model in this uh, dark matter working group. In fact, uh, another model is um, highly proposed and the IDM is mentioned as something which might lead to similar um, similar uh, final states, but uh, so far there's no dedicated search and I think uh, there should be, I mean, publicly available results from a dedicated search, let's formulate it this way. And I think there should be because the two, although the final states are similar to many things you have in ZUSI or in this 2 HGMA, <clears throat> the topologies are different, so the question is really whether you're not cutting out, you know, optimizing for one model, you're cutting out the interesting parameter space in another model. So I think this should be done. Now for the second question, uh, for the low mass um, uh, benchmark points, I'm trying to find 
I mean, Jan, do you have the benchmark points in the? In the we'll probably have to take this offline then. I think. Okay. Tony. Anyway, so you share it in the chat. Uh, okay. Okay. Great. I share no. it in the chat. Okay. Very good. So the, I mean, then the question is, of course, how low can you go in these masses of the of the heavy scalars, right? This is the question. So yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Many thanks indeed. Okay, well, we should probably move on then. Uh, and our next um, presentation is going to be given by Nicholas, um, who's going to talk about um, Higgs measurements at future circular colliders. Yeah, can you uh, hear me? We can. We can hear you and see you well. Okay, let's uh, let me try to share. Um, sit. So, can you uh, see my slides? Yep, that's perfect. And I'll try and give you a warning five minutes before the end of your time. Um, so please go ahead. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. I'm going to talk about Higgs measurements at uh, FCC. And uh, before that, let me uh, talk a bit about the Higgs boson and its status. The Higgs boson is the latest fundamental particle discovered. Uh, and it is a crucial component uh, of the standard model, but also of uh, beyond standard model physics um, scenarios. And it's also a very large part of the LHC Higgs pro uh, physics program. Uh, and of course, as such, it plays a very important role in the design of uh, uh, any high energy frontier future collider. The high luminosity LHC, which is an approved uh, project uh, uh, is benchmarked against uh, the Higgs production. Um, we have Higgs factories, electron and positron Higgs factories, uh, uh, like the uh, ILC and CLIC, which we saw uh, previously, and uh, also future hadron colliders and uh, hadron electron machines. Uh, and this talk, I will cover Higgs studies in the context of FCC, um, EHH, and EH. Now, talking about FCC, FCC uh, stands for Future Circular Collider, and it is a project, uh, a proposed project at CERN. It requires a new tunnel in the Geneva area. And this tunnel is going to host, if, if, it, if this project is approved, uh, two or three accelerators, FCCE, H8, and uh, possibly EH uh, as well. For all these machines, Higgs physics is either a strategic priority or an important part of their physics uh, program. And the main resource, although not the only resource for physics accelerator and performance is the FCC conceptual design report that was published in 2019. It, it is available for free for in this uh, link that I have here. Now I will start about discussing FCCE. Now this is an electron positron collider at uh, several center of mass energies. Um, and uh, it, we have assumed in the studies uh, uh, two interaction points, which means uh, two detectors. Uh, so it will run, uh, it is expected to run at the Z pole at the WW production threshold, at ZH threshold and uh, TT bar threshold. And the last three uh, runs are the most interesting in terms of uh, Higgs production. So we expect that 1 million Higgs bosons will be produced in association um, with a, a Z boson. So this diagram here and 0.1 million Higgs bosons will be produced via uh, WW fusion. There is a possibility to have a run uh, at exactly the Higgs mass. And this actually is something um, uh, it's very interesting in the, but we'll cover in the next talk. Now, the nice thing about FCCEE is the so-called recoil method. Uh, and this is very interesting because uh, it gives the opportunity to have an absolute determination of the coupling of the Higgs to Z bosons, uh, which is a unique feature of uh, lepton machines. So the way this method works is that you tag the Z decay, uh, probably going to take a decay that is clean like to electrons or muons, and then you calculate the recoil mass. Um, in this way, you can measure the cross-section E to ZH independent of the Higgs decay. So that's why we say it is an absolute measurement of the coupling of Higgs to Z. And if you have this uh, coupling, uh, then um, you can measure, for instance, the Higgs total width by measuring the cross-section time transfer ratio to, of Higgs to ZZ. And in a similar way, all other couplings that the FCCE is sensitive uh, to. 
And of course, uh, this also um, denotes a synergy with other co colliders because this result will inform um, future Higgs measurements uh, for other machines as well. Now I will show you a recent uh, a result for this recoil method that was uh, uh, became public just a few months ago. Uh, it is using only Z to mu mu. And uh, you see here the distribution of the recoil mass that I was telling you in the previous slide. And you see that there is a clear um, Higgs peak at 125 GeV in uh, which you can fit uh, and uh, you can estimate the uh, uncertainty on the cross-section production of, of the Higgs to uh, be about 1%. Uh, now you can, uh, of course, use this uh, recoil method to estimate uh, branching ratio and couplex uh, measurements. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, you can measure almost uh, everything uh, at percent level of uh, precision, with the exception of uh, rare decays like Higgs to gamma gamma or uh, Higgs to mu mu, which of course one million um, uh, Higgs the case is not good enough for, for that. Another thing you can measure in FCCE is the Higgs mass. Now, this is somewhat of lower priority because Higgs mass will be measured at high luminosity late C um, with precision, estimated precision about uh, 20 MeV, uh, which is good enough for most things, although not everything. Uh, in FCCE, there, there are two ways of measuring it. Uh, first of all, from the recoil method, and there is an estimation that if you use new mu channel only, um, you get something like 8 MeV of um, you know, precision. Uh, but also, you can do it from a scan of the Z8 threshold, and uh, depending on what assumptions you make and what uh, data you have, um, you get something like probably 10 MeV. In FCC, you can also measure the self-coupling. So sensitivity to self-coupling uh, uh, comes from higher order corrections. And the contributions to the cross-sections due to this higher order correction actually depend uh, significantly on the center of mass energy. So this means that you need to run in several, to combine data from several um, mass measurements in order to get uh, um, um, some uh, relevant constraint to the self-coupling and it's expected to get something like 33 percent which is probably um, I think it's probably better than high luminosity uh, LHC. Now let me switch uh, machine so I will go to discuss FCCH8 so the FCCH8 plan is to deliver 30 inverse autobans of PP collisions at 100 TV during 25 years of operation. This is 10 times the luminosity of high luminosity LHC, but also seven times the energy and eight times the collision rate. The Higgs production rate there is uh, something like uh, 100 to 500 times the LHC rate. And uh, this allows you to do precision measurements in rare Higgs decays like Higgs to gamma gamma and mu mu and Z gamma that cannot be done very well in FCCE. Uh, but also, uh, because of these statistics, you can probe uh, the high Higgs PT uh, range, uh, even beyond 1 TV, with uh, uh, very good um, uh, precision. Uh, there is a synergy of, with FCCE when it comes to couplex measurement. And uh, also, uh, it is the best measurement of Higgs self-coupling with respect to, to any other uh, future machine. So let me show you the Higgs PT, the FCC HH. This is what I was telling you in the previous slide. Um, so you can see that uh, the differential cross section can be measured in uh, up to a few TV with actually precision that is uh, well uh, below 10%. So uh, you can measure, of course, cross sections and branching ratios in uh, FCC. And the nice thing here, is uh, that you measure everything at the percent level, even um, uh, Higgs to gamma gamma uh, and mu uh, mu, which is actually uh, something that is more difficult to, uh, to do. 
Uh, of course, okay, you, you cannot do, uh, you can measure Higgs, the Higgs, but that's slightly uh, worse precision. And this is, of course, because that's, it's a very rare uh, process, much uh, rare, but single Higgs uh, production. Uh, as I said, that uh, there is a lot of uh, discussion in many references about the synergy with FCCE, um, about using the couplings, uh, also uh, determining the top you have a coupling. So I, I have the references here if somebody needs to uh, needs more detail. Um, and another thing you can do is uh, Higgs to invisible. So Higgs to invisible, um, there has been a study that is uh, shown in this uh, reference that I have uh, here. This, uh, they have taken inspiration from what we do at the LHC. And they have done an analysis that shows that the sensitivity uh, will be to a branching ratio of a few 10 to the minus uh, four, uh, as you see uh, here, which is well below the standard model uh, Higgs to invisible, which is Higgs to Z, Z to four neutrinos, which is something like uh, 0.1%. Now, uh, multi Higgs production is, is something actually that is very important in FCCHH because it is a, a process that um, uh, this machine is very sensitive to. So, there has been several uh, studies. Um, the most promising signature is considered to be uh, BB gamma gamma. Um, there are three documents that uh, I've seen that have done this study, and uh, they show that the sensitivity to Higgs self coupling will be between six and 10%. Uh, and uh, there has been also other channels that have been uh, studied like BBZZ, BBWW, which all, all of them are um, significantly worse than uh, BB Gamma Gamma. Uh, another thing you can do is triple Higgs production. Uh, now, uh, in these diagrams that I, I show you here, the X axis is the Higgs self-coupling. And the Y axis is the quartic coupling. So this coupling that appears in this diagram that uh, you see here, um, uh, the plot on the upper left shows the uh, production cross-section for this uh, process in FCCH8. And uh, there has been studies in the literature about uh, uh, four Bs, uh, two gammas and four Bs, two taus. Uh, and of course, okay, that's a, that's a difficult uh, thing. You can get some kind of constraints. Of, it's not you know, uh, measurement, it's not a precision measurement uh, here, but it seems that you have some kind of sensitivity in, in this very rare um, uh, process as well. Now, I want to discuss a bit FCC E8 as well. So this is, um, uh, this is a machine that will collide a proton beam from FCCHH to a 50 TV beam with a 60 GV electron beam provided by electron recovery LINAC, which is a separate ac accelerator uh, with respect to FCC. Uh, it will run concurrently with FCCHH. Um, one detector is assumed, uh, two inverse autobahns, most probably, and uh, a very, very low pileup um, data. And uh, you can do very precise PDF measurements, other QCD physics, but also Higgs physics and some beyond standard model physics. So um, with respect to Higgs production, uh, in FCC E8, it's uh, via WW or ZZ fusion. And uh, over the 20 or 25 years of operation, you expect to get similar statistics to uh, what you will get in FCC E. So, in general, you expect similar precision uh, in uh, the coupling. So okay, you, you cannot do the recoil met method uh, there, but uh, so, you, so you don't have an absolute measure of the coupling, but still you have uh, very good precision. Uh, and uh, multi Higgs production, the Higgs production actually has been, uh, can be proud in FCC EH, and there has been some studies. Um, in the 4B channels. And uh, there's been a very conservative study that shows that there will be 20% uh, sensitivity in self-coupling if you use 10 inverse autobahn. Uh, but there is all, already some evidence that actually this can be improved by a lot if you use uh, 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 multivariate uh, techniques. So to, to summarize, um, FCC offers a complete package for Higgs physics. 
um, you get the ultimate precision to Higgs couplings to sub percent or percent uh, level uh, measurement of Higgs self coupling, access to very rare Higgs processes, including uh, quartic couplings. And of course, there's a synergy among the different accelerators of, of the project uh, with each of them bringing uh, unique features. So, but, but so from my side, thank you very much. Many thanks, Nicholas. Uh, and um, are there questions for this presentation? Uh, actually, I was going to ask really about what you um, come to at the very last point, actually, Nicholas. So, so can you tease out for me again, what really are the different advantages um, of the three different colliders in terms of their Higgs couplings? Yeah, so the, with FCCE, you can, um, well, if you are asking about the synergy, FCCE, you can uh, really get the, um, an absolute measurement. So uh, the coupling of uh, Higgs to Z, which can inform FCCHH because the measurement there is essentially ratio of, of couplings. You don't have a, a, an absolute measurement. And with FCC uh, E8, uh, you could get a very good uh, PDF measurement, which can inform the uncertainties that you have in uh, not only Higgs uh, measurements, but also you know, uh, other measurements and searches that you can do in HH. I mean, certainly in FCC E8, because you get similar precision um, to FCC EE with a couple, you can do an overall combination and you know, improve uh, e e even better. Of course, that's also. Uh, a possibility, but that's not a, a unique uh, feature, I believe. Okay, many thanks. Um, and uh, there's a question from Gordon. Yeah, so I had a question about the Higgs twin physical portion in the talk. What's not clear to me, I'm actually interested in, say, PBF Higgs. Is any particular FCC detector like EH, HH, EE going to be more sensitive to that particular? production mode uh you mean vbf uh Higgs? i mean it's definitely you you can do it in fcc h8 uh now the production that you have in uh, fcc e8 right it is a vector boson fusion right so in principle uh you may be able to measure uh, the uh, Higgs to invisible here, although no, actually, no, actually, I, I, no, no, that's sorry, I take that back. Maybe uh, here because you have the, the problem, but maybe not difficult. So the most relevant for that is FCCHH. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Only FCCHH might be able to probe VBF Higgs production modes here, but I don't think EH or EE could do it, but I could be wrong. Yeah, if you if you are as, asking for Higgs to invisible specifically, yeah, I think that E8, I, I don't think you can do it, at least not not as well. Okay, um, and uh, many thanks again, uh, Nicholas. Um, and uh, let's move on um, to David. Uh, and David is going to tell us about um, electron Yukawa determination at FCC EE. Um, hello, can you hear me? We can, we can't, we can't, we can't see you. I don't know whether you're trying to share your camera. Or not. Mm, I do have a, a strong, a large bandwidth. I prefer okay, to. Okay, no problem at all. Okay, no problem. thank you, thank you first for inviting me to give uh, this talk. I will be presenting results from the FCC EE uh, study group about the uh, constraints on the electron Yukawa coupling from the S channel E plus and minus to Higgs production at the FCC EE. We heard in a previous talk what FCC EE is, so I won't go into these details. Uh, if you want, uh, if you after the meeting or during the meeting, if you want to check uh, the uh, written, the write up of this uh, measurement, you can check this archive uh, preprint that will appear soon in uh, EPCC uh, plus. So le let me um, let me start with a somehow provocative statement. Uh, the usual lore that uh, the standard model is, is closed with the discovery of the Higgs boson at the LHC. Is only true for the uh, uh, mass generation of uh, electroweak bosons and for the third family of fermions, but it is not true clearly for the uh, stable uh, matter, visible matter in the universe that is form of UD electrons and, and neutrinos. So we, we have uh, all those Yukawa couplings that all these fermions get their masses in principle through coupling through the Higgs. 
field, but uh, they are not accessible at the LHC. So um, the truth is that in 15 years, uh, when we close the LHC, we won't have any actual confirmation that the stable matter of the universe gets its mass through the Higgs mechanism. And then of course, there is the big elephant in the room of how the uh, neutrinos get their masses, whether if they are direct particles, then this is a tiny coupling. There could be other mechanisms, of course, with heavy uh, right-handed neutrinos. So for um, uh, first generation quarks, UDS light quarks, there are some proposals to look at the exclusive uh, final states where you could set some limits. Uh, for the electron Yukawa, you see that this is 10 to the minus six. And um, the only way, as I will show you, the only way to really prove this, uh, this coupling is by looking at the S channel production of the Higgs boson, resonant production of the Higgs boson, and then looking for a final state that is consistent with the production of the Higgs. Um, so first of all, I said that in principle, uh, the, the, the electron gets its mass through the coupling through the, the Higgs doublet, but uh, there are PSM ways by which the Yukawa can get, uh, sorry, by which the electron can get their masses by mixing with heavy vector like leptons, with Higgs doublets, with a he heavy scalar doublet, or uh, with a heavy vector. Uh, in any case, um, the current, um, the current Higgs electron coupling limits are very, uh, uh, very weak. So from the study of um, the looking for searching for uh, Higgs 2e plus e minus on top of the huge uh, Drelgian background of the LHC, CMS was able to set a limit at 600 times of the standard model value. Uh, Lab 2 is even less competitive. G minus two uh, the, of the electron can constrain somehow the relative part, the, the real part of the Yukawa. And uh, in principle, if you want to trans transform those limits into upper limits into, uh, sorry, yes, into the minimum mass of uh, any BSM that couples to the electron and, 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 and generates its mass, we, right now we are the, the few TB range. There are also unsuppressed dimension 10 operators that are also possible and, and could compete with those. But uh, okay, that's just a snapshot of what, how can the electrons get their mass beyond uh, the standard model. As I said, uh, the coupling, sorry, the branching ratio of Higgs to e plus and minus is tiny because it goes with the square of the mass. So this is 10 to minus nine. So this is uh, completely impossible to see at the LHC. Um, so the idea when we, when seven, eight years ago, we started to discuss uh, the FCCE, we realized of the huge luminosities available at 125 GB, we realized that uh, we could invert instead of looking for Higgs to plus and minus, uh, try to produce the Higgs resonant E plus and minus to Higgs. And if you plug in this uh, in the standard uh, relativistic bright binary expression for the cross section, you get that this is a very small 1.6 uh, femtobarns for the nominal mass and width of the standard model. Uh, of course, this type of S-channel production was considered for a muon collider at the, the Higgs mass, because here the cross-section is many, many times larger, 70 picoverns, so you can study this. But this, this channel was never considered because it was uh, thought to be completely uh, hopeless given the, the, the small uh, cross-sections. As you will see, this is even smaller than that for the reasons that I will explain next. So in theory, if you take a look uh, at face value to this plot, uh, you think, okay, I will integrate 20 inverse atom per year. So then we are able to produce 30,000 Higgs uh, rationally. So this could give us a chance to observe this coupling. But as you will see, this is a much more complicated thing because of uh, three problems. First of all, beam energy spread. So the beams are not monochromatic. They have a spread and then you do not hit the, the resonant. Uh, cross-section of the bright beckner. Secondly, you have ISR, namely the photons uh, before fusioning, they can radiate a photon. And even if you radiate a one MeV, two MeV photon, tiny soft photon, you will get off the resonant peak. And uh, last but not least, there are huge backgrounds that produce all these final states. And, and But if, and that's three big ifs, if we control all this, we are able to, to measure the Yukawa coupling. We are even able to determine the width because uh, naturally, we will be scanning the resonant point and then determining the width. And if there is any uh, nearly degenerate uh, scalar or any other state, uh, uh, particle resonance sharing 125 GB, we will be able to, to see it too. Now, I say that the thing is much more complicated because this 1.64 femtobarns for the Fry Bigner, uh, this gets uh, reduced by a factor of two. 
when you take into account the Gaussian energy spread. So assume you have a, a beam that you know, each beam you know to within uh, uh, say two MeV then it, uh, or three MeV. So this means that the, the center of mass energy spread is, uh, is commensurate with the Higgs width of a four MeV. You already have a, a depletion of a factor of two. Uh, and then the question is, can we reach this MeV, uh, few MeV uh, energy resolution in the center of mass via, via, via monochromatization? I will go back to this and which will, be, uh, sorry. And what is the luminosity loss price for this? Let me go to this rapidly. The idea of monochromatizing, monochromatizing beams means that in normal collisions, the, uh, the, this person at the interaction point is, uh, has the same sign. Whereas when you monochromatize beams, what you do is you change the dispersion at the interaction point. So basically you change the sign of the dispersion and then you get a, you get a resolution which is much better. And in some cases, even you can increase the frequency of events at the center of the distribution. The question is to what extent we can reduce the beam energy uh, resolution. So if we run non-monochromatize without, uh, so with uh, the same sign dispersion, we get 46, uh, 46 uh, MEF, not four. And let's see how much uh, there are studies uh, ongoing in the last years to see how, lo how low can we go in uh, reducing the beam energy spread. I will come back to this. What we decided for our studies is to assume that an energy spread of the order of the natural Higgs width can be reached for MeV. But then on top of this, we have, as I said, uh, so photon radiation from the uh, fusioning E plus E minus, which brings in a, an extra 40% uh, reduction of the, of the yields. So if you convolve uh, both things, you have a, now, a, 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 it's not a bright binary, it's a Voitian, it's, a, it's an asymmetric Voitian, where you see that the peak cross section is at uh, uh, here, but when you consider the four MeV, you get something on the ballpark of 280 attobarks, okay? And that's, that will be our working point. Namely, we assume full realistic ISR, and we assume a, a beam energy spread of four MeV, then we expect a cross section of 280 attobarks. So let's see. Now, uh, then the third problem, as I mentioned in my introduction, is that then you have huge, uh, huge, much bigger backgrounds. And uh, let me go through this rapidly. What you, the type of signal we're looking at, we're looking for is C plus and minus going to Higgs and then decaying in the usual channels. But of course, you have many backgrounds that go through different uh, particles uh, in the S channel or in the T channel that will have the same final state. So what we did is we run uh, PCI8 uh, with 10 different final states for Higgs signal plus backgrounds we with uh, decays at NLO and uh, and okay I won't go into detail fast jet packages uh, for the for final state with jets event shape variables were added to try to reduce backgrounds and what we did is we scaled the PCI cross sections to the expected uh, beam energies for the signal to the expected beam energy sp spread uh, of 4 MeV and included also ISR so with this then we let's take a look at the uh, type of um, Cross sections we expect. Of course, as you all know, Higgs to be is a dominal decay channel. So you expect about 58% of this. Uh, this is a, this gives you 164 uh, attobarns. But take a look, the, the E plus and minus going to be bar through uh, gamma Z star is 19 picobarns. So you see here signal over background is 10 to the minus five. So you go through all these channels and you see that the numbers are, are very sorry, are, are tiny. Uh, tiny, and uh, we don't even list the final states six to four jets, or or, or uh, because they are they are very small, or four leptons because basically they have zero counts. But if you take a look at all the list of uh, cross sections for the signal of and, and, and order of magnitude for the backgrounds, you identify two channels where there is some hope. One is um, Higgs to glue glue. This is the third most uh, common uh, decay channel of the Higgs. And of course, uh, the, the nice thing is that the, the Z and the photon, they do not couple to, to gluons. So this channel is impossible uh, in the backgrounds. But of course, unless you misidentify the light quarks by gluons. And if we assume uh, a misidentification uh, rate of 1% of a quark for a light, uh, a light quark for a gluon, then you get then 10 to the minus three with 23 attobarks. So this is not, any more um, uh, so crazy. Um, and also out of the rest of the channels, uh, CC, CC star channels are tiny. You have Atobar and cross sections or even smaller. So those are hopeless in, in, in terms of signal counts number, numbers. 
But in the in the middle of this, you have the WW final states, and in particular, the lepton plus jets also has some chance. We have 23 femtobarns of uh, irreducible background compared to uh, 26 attobarn. So it's only uh, 10 to the minus three. So what we did is, uh, as I said, we, we, we run all this signal production and all this background production with TCA8. All the events were showered and hadronized and decayed. We assume a final acceptance of final state particle acceptance uh, uh, consistent with uh, FCC acceptance between five degrees to 175 in polar angle. As I said, we, we run a fast KT, sorry, the um, KT algorithm with exclusive uh, jets with fast, um, uh, with a fast jet. We run isolation for leptons and, and photons where, whenever needed. And we assume uh, reconstruction inefficiencies for jets, tau, gamma, and, and electron that is listed here. And the first thing we did is we, uh, we define a final state uh, signal uh, uh, configurations. This is a pre-selection to eliminate reducible backgrounds that keep as much as possible of the signal and they get rid of uh, things that do not like, like the, uh, they do not li look like the uh, uh, target Higgs decay channel. And, and then on, after this pre-selection, we define a uh, multivariate analysis with 50 variables for all the kinematical properties of uh, each, for all the final objects, single jet, single photon, single lepton, pair of objects, and in general, n-wise combinations of triple objects also. We add uh, global event variables, uh, thrust, uh, sphericity, and so on. We add MELA variables for the uh, angular analysis, and so on and so forth. And we identified two most significant channels. The, the most significant one is uh, Higgs 2 glue glue with two exclusive jets identified as gluons with a 70% efficiency each uh, for a light quarter rate of 1%. This is uh, challenging right now. And this is about seven times better for the mistagen rate than what we have at the LHC, but uh, we will be running at in a cleaner, much cleaner E plus and minus machine. And after many years of, uh, of improvements in the in, in parton showers, thanks to a uh, uh, huge uh, uh, e Z to QQR and also Higgs to glue glue uh, in the previous runs before, uh, before this particular run. So we consider that this is not impossible. We can discuss it in the questions if you want. Then we run on the, the uh, boosted decision tree uh, on the rest of the variables and we get this type of response. This is normalized response. Of course, this is 1000 times larger than this one. So things have to be scale, but uh, cutting on, on the BDT response, you get a signal reduction of a factor of two for a background reduction of uh, 17 times. So at the end you get, uh, we expect 55 signal events on top of 2,500 uh, background events. This corresponds basically to 1.1 sigma uh, significance. We, we run um, a likelihood uh, profile ratio significance, but it's very, it's very close to the, to the standard naive uh, S over square root of P significance. The second most significant channel is, uh, is Higgs uh, w, w star going to lepton plus jets here. We apply the MVA that's with all the analysis, uh, with all the variables, but we wanted to get a little a grasp a handle on the, uh, on the type of uh, discrimination power of each uh, variables. And for example, the energy of the jets, uh, if you put a threshold, it will kill uh, uh, the uh, continuum. Uh, if you set a limit on the, on the visible mass, also will kill this, of course, uh, uh, if you want, you can kill also taus requiring that the mass of the missing energy is below 3 GB and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, the, the BDT, so basically those are cuts that kit, uh, let's, uh, let's say reducible backgrounds. At the end of the day, you are left with a reducible continuum. And uh, this is killed mostly by the BDT exploiting the MELA variables, uh, exploiting the opposite W plus minus polarization in the Higgs decay. And uh, this you see here, the type of, uh, of a different angular shape compared going to the spin zero scalar compared to going through a, through, through a WW in the T channel. At the end, you expect 55 signals on top of 11,000 events from the background. So this buys you a significance of 0 0.5 sigma. Thanks, David. We, uh, you, yes. you, you're coming out of your time, so if you could speed up a little bit. Yes, I will, I will okay. rapidly. So we did the exercise for all the channels. At the end, we get a significance of 1.3 sigma. For the inverse atobar, you can transform this into a 95% confidence level of 1.6 times the standard model value. Okay. Uh, now, uh, 
the reality is that we, as I said, we assume um, a working point here with uh, 10, 10 inverse atobar integrated with four MeV commensurate with the Higgs natural width. Then when we discuss with the accelerator experts what the monochromatization actual working points are, they've been studying for a few years and they give us this curve here, where you see that uh, for the, 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 the smallest uh, beam energy spread is about six MeV, but then you get to about 1.5, 1.3 uh, inverse atom and you have a, a luminosity loss, not 10 as we are, we are considering here in our benchmark point. Now, the best working point today is about uh, uh, beam energy spread of seven MeV and uh, integrated luminosity of two inverse atomar. So with this, uh, you, the, the, the actual significance is 0.4 sigma. This is per IP and per year, okay? So if we have four IPs and we run more than one year, you scale the numbers appropriately. So if, if you can transform this uh, plane into, not into the significance contours for the, for the production of the Higgs rationality, but on electron Yukawa limits, and you improve here because of course the, the cross-section, so the, the Yukawa goes as the square of the cross-section. And, and we, we see that we are able to set a limit of 2.5 times the standard model value at 95 CL, again, per IP and per year, okay? So this may, say, this may seem somehow uh, uh, not great, but this is about uh, 30 times better than what the FCCHH can achieve and 100 times better than what the high LHC can achieve, which is this year. Uh, and of course, as I said, this is per IP and per year. So if we run in a few years and with four IPs as we are considering right now, we can get at the standard model, uh, standard model uh, UCAVA values. So I come to my conclusion, I present to, to you today the resonant channel Higgs production at CCE running at the, at the, the pole mass of the Higgs. The cross section is 164. If you take into account ISR plus beam energy spread, you get something like 280 attobarns. Then you need the first thing you need is to, to know where the Higgs is within MEV. And we heard this from the previous talk that this is feasible to be to, to within two to three MEV, thanks to the Higgs uh, Z plus the, the, the threshold scan. Uh, we run a general level study for signal backgrounds for 10 decay channels. And we see that for 10 inverse atobarn and a beam energy spread of four MeV with a significance of 1.3 sigma with Higgs to glue glue and Higgs to WW star electron plus jet being the most significant channels. Uh, if we take into account current, current monochromatization working points, we are able to set li uh, limits of 2.5 times the standard model Yukawa per IP and per year. In any, uh, so there are still the possibility that some breakthrough in monochromatization improves this, uh, approaching this, then of course, then we will be get, we'll get much closer to the standard model. But then, in, uh, then we are also doing some studies on some exclusive final state that could uh, improve significantly the signal over the significance. And uh, maybe, uh, hopefully in the next months, I will come back to this in, in future conferences. But the takeaway message is that we can set at, in the worst case scenario, we can set limits 100 times better than the high LHC and 30 times better than the FCCHH. And this is the only way to probe the uh, coupling of the Higgs to the first generation uh, uh, family and to set limits on BSM scale affecting the electron you have above 100 dB. Thanks for your attention. Many thanks indeed, David. Very interesting proposal. Um, uh, are there any quick questions um, for David? Um, uh, Nicholas has one. Yeah, maybe that's a, a very naive question. I was wondering whether it is possible to use this kind of runs around the Higgs uh, mass to uh, measure the Higgs width and whether that would uh, make any sense because you, know, you can measure it in other ways as well. Um, I mean, so as you know, the advantage of FCCE is that we are able to control the uh, the beams to within a MEV type of resolution. So at any moment, we will know, thanks to resonant depolarization, we will be, we will be able to know if we are probing the, the Higgs line shape at, at this point here, at this point here, 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 here. So in principle, if we keep the information on, uh, on the center of mass energy, we will be able to know where we are hitting the, the, the resonant peak, at which point are we, are, we are scanning it. So. Uh, this provides you extra information because, of course, it's not the same if we if we um, if we run at uh, 
five MeV above the nominal mass or five MeV below that. So the expectation in terms of yields is will be different. But at the same time, you will be naturally you will be scanning the width of the Higgs boson, and that's how uh, that's how limits. Or, well, that's how indirect. Well, how, that's how directly you can determine the Higgs width too. But I mean, this is just. Uh, I mean, we know this can be done, but we have not quantified actually the, the actual constraint on the width that we can set uh, by this method. Many thanks, very interesting. Okay, and um, my, my apologies again for having to, uh, to rush you slightly, David, but very interesting idea. Um, okay, um, let us come to a um, uh, uh, rather different subject um, for our final presentation this afternoon. Um, Nick uh, Prowers is gonna tell us about the intermediate water Cherenkov detector for the hypercamia candy experiment. Thank you, I'll just uh, try and share my screen. Perfect, we can see you. Uh, sorry, I might need to restart my Zoom quickly. It doesn't seem to be letting me share the screen. Sorry about this. I'll just try and restart it as quickly as possible. Okay, thanks. Um, if you have a problem, I can always share the slides for you. Okay, let's bear with us a moment. I think uh, uh, Nick is trying to restart. Hi, Nick, do we have you back? Hi, yeah. Um, unfortunately, it still seems to not show me any option to share the screen. Okay, uh, well, I can share them for you if you wish, and you can tell me when you want me to move on. Can you see that okay? Uh, yeah, I can see that. Um, so yeah, thanks for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about the intermediate water Cherenkov detector for HyperK. Um, and thanks also for rescheduling to accommodate my time zone. Um, so if you go on to the next slide. Uh, so the HyperK experiment is a uh, next generation world leading neutrino experiment, the successor to Super Cameo Candy. Uh, there was a talk on HyperK uh, by Matthew Malak earlier today, um, and it's currently under construction uh, due to take data in 2027 uh, and has quite a broad uh, physics program, um, including uh, neutrino physics coming from terrestrial sources as well as astrophysical sources um, and also searching for new physics such as nuclear decay. Um, the FAR detector is a huge water sharing of uh, detector which provides uh, a very large mass which gives us a very large event rate um, allowing us to detect the uh, smallest changes in uh, neutrino oscillations uh, with the key measurement being the search for CP violation in, uh, in neutrinos. Uh, so the, in addition to the FAR detector, we also have uh, a suite of near detectors, which includes an intermediate water sharing of detector, which is the topic of this talk. Um, there will be upgraded near detectors for HyperK uh, at 280 meters. Um, and there's also a, a water sharing of test beam experiment, which will uh, take data at CERN next year. And there was a post on that by Lauren Anthony. Uh, so on to the next slide. Uh, so for the long baseline program for HyperK, uh, we have the neutrino beam at the opposite side of Japan, um, around 295 kilometers away. Uh, and this produces a beam of uh, muon neutrinos, uh, which pass through the near detectors and intermediate water Cherenkov detector uh, before reaching the, the far detector. And by observing the oscillations of these muon neutrinos uh, disappearing and appearing as electron neutrinos, uh, we're able to observe and measure the oscillation parameters of the neutrinos, uh, including the delta CP parameter uh, for CP violation. The neutrino beam itself is actually directed two and a half degrees away from the detector, the, from the far detector. Um, and that's because uh, this two and a half degree angle gives us a neutrino energy spectrum, which is peaked at the 
uh, the energy which has the maximum oscillations. Uh, so on to the next slide. Uh, so for this um, for this CP violation measurement, uh, at the moment T2K uh, has fairly large systematic errors, and this will need to be reduced for the Hyper-K experiment uh, to make the most use of uh, the increased beam power and the much larger far detector, which will give us a much larger event rate of about 20 times what is seen at Super-K. And these systematic errors are basically uh, split into sort of three separate sections. There's the systematic errors due to the modeling of the detector itself, uh, the interactions of the neutrinos in, in the water, uh, and the uncertainties on the, on the original neutrino beam flux. And so the beam and interaction parts of these uncertainties are, are best constrained using uh, near detector measurements. Uh, so on the next slide. Uh, so the intermediate water sharing cloth detector is a uh, planned new detector that will be built uh, to do exactly what I was just describing, measuring the flux and cross sections of the unoscillated beam uh, to constrain those far, uh, this systematic fire detector. It's located around a kilometer from the beam source. Um, and one of the unique uh, features of this detector is that it actually moves vertically within a 50 meter tall pit. And this is so that it can measure uh, neutrino interactions occurring at different angles off the neutrino beam center, uh, giving us different uh, neutrino energy spectra. The hardware of the detector uh, consists of uh, a number of multi-PMT modules, uh, which have been developed for this detector. Um, its water is doped with gadolinium, which provide us a signal for neutrons so that we can tag uh, neutrons coming out of the neutrinos, as well as the charged leptons. Um, and there's several challenges involved here in, in both the hardware um, calibration and reconstruction in order to, to make precision measurements in such a small water sharing block detector uh, feasible. So on the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, the detector moves vertically in this 50 meter pit, pit giving us the, the ability to span off axis angles and measure different uh, neutrino fluxes. So you can see here uh, at the different angles, as you move to uh, larger angles, the energy spectrum becomes narrower and peaked at lower energies, while at, while at uh, closer to the, to the beam center, the flux becomes uh, a wider spectrum with a, a higher energy. And so if you consider the, the spectrum we expect to see at the far detector, although it is at two and a half degrees off axis, uh, the oscillations mean that it won't be exactly the same as the two and a half degree off axis spectrum that we would see in the, in the intermediate detector. Uh, but by providing, by, by measuring at different off axis angles at this intermediate position, we're able to take linear combinations of these measurements uh, and effectively uh, produce measurements of the neutrino cross sections for arbitrary uh, neutrino fluxes. For example, we can mimic the expected oscillated neutrino spectrum at the far detector, or we can produce something like uh, monochromatic beams uh, by taking linear combinations of these different fluxes. Uh, so on the next slide. Um, so one of the key measurements of this is to measure the electron neutrino and electron antineutrino cross sections, uh, which currently in the, in the, in the uh, T2K CP violation measurements are constrained mostly from almost entirely from just from theory rather than near detector measurements. Uh, and, uh, and so the IWCD provides us an opportunity to measure these cross sections directly, uh, in particular for measuring this W ratio of electron neutrino to muon neutrino cross sections for neutrinos versus antineutrinos, which will be the key. Um, the key quantity that goes into the systematic errors in the far detector measurement for CP violation. Uh, one of the largest backgrounds for this measurement is incoming uh, gammas into the detector. So gammas look very similar to electrons in the detector, almost indistinguishable. Um, and so the detector has an outer detector region, uh, which uh, is active and, and can actually detect these gammas coming in so that we can veto those. Uh, so there was a poster by uh, Charlie Nesby um, 
which has more details on this measurement. And on the next slide. Um, so onto the, some of the technical challenges for the detector. Uh, of course, moving a detector vertically can be challenging. And so uh, we've developed a system where, which works by um, having a region connected to the detector, which is filled with air, which makes the entire thing actually buoyant in water. So then if you fill the water below the detector, uh, this raises it to the desired level um, while it moves along uh, a system of rails, which, which guided it into place. Uh, then you have the water purification system, the readout electronics and the calibration systems located on top of the tank uh, so that those can move along with the tank as well. So on to the next slide. Um, for the photosensor hardware, we've developed these multi-PMT modules. Um, and these are required because compared to the far detector, um, having a much smaller detector, we need much smaller PMTs. And to aid construction of the detector, we have these uh, PMTs grouped into modules of 19 PMTs each. Uh, this is a watertight module and it contains the electronics uh, inside the module itself. It also has a scintillator panel uh, which detects, uh, detects light coming in from the outer detector. Um, and each of these three inch PMTs or eight centimeter PMTs uh, provide increased position resolution. Uh, they also have better timing resolution, about half the, uh, uh, half the width of the 50 centimeter PMTs used in the fire detector. Uh, and by having them in slightly different directions, we get some directionality information as well. So these multi-PMT modules will be used for the IWCD, but they're also um, planned to be used as part of the, the photo coverage in the fire detector, uh, in particular to allow us to better calibrate the, the 50 centimeter PMTs that provide most of the fire detector's photo coverage. So on the next slide. Um, so we've developed a system for the mass production of these multi-PMTs. Uh, basically, we start from a stainless steel backplate. Uh, we install the components together, the, the PMTs inside a 3D support matrix, along with the electronics uh, inside a PVC cylinder. Uh, then we lower an acrylic dome onto the top of the cylinder uh, using a specially designed jig. Uh, and uh, fix it in place using a stainless steel ring. The PMTs themselves, before going into the assembly, um, have optical gel uh, um, attached to them so that uh, we get good optical contact between the PMTs and the acrylic dome. Uh, so on the next slide. Uh, we've also developed new uh, electronics hardware for, for these multi-PMT modules. Um, so one of the uh, key things for the IWCD that's, that's more important than in the fire detector is that we need to have a full waveform uh, digitization and, and readouts. Um, and this is because the IWCD being very close to the beam source uh, will have pile up of multiple neutrino interactions that we don't get in the fire detector. And so by having the full waveform, uh, we're able to do a better job of identifying and, and reconstructing those pile up events. Uh, so, yeah, so new uh, electronics has been developed to allow us to digitize and, and read out those and to process the, um, the full waveform uh, on the multi-PMT modules themselves uh, to reduce the readout size. The PMTs also have uh, Cockcroft Walton uh, high voltage bases on each of them, um, and this reduces the power consumption uh, for the total module. So on the next slide. Um, so because the IWCD is such a small detector, uh, to be able to produce the precision measurements that we need, uh, we're going to need much more precise calibration than, actually, than has been previously done in water sharing of detectors. Um, and so a couple of the systems that we're developing for this include a, a calibration source deployment system, which allow us to deploy calibration sources up to any arbitrary position within the detector. And this works by having a arm which lowers down into the detector um, with a, uh, so, th so this arm can rotate uh, entirely around the sector, being able to move to any position azimuthally. Uh, then there's a cart which moves along the arm, uh, allowing you to move to any position radially, and then that lowers down the, uh, the source into the detector at any position vertically. 
Uh, another challenge for calibration of this detector is that because it's a moving detector, uh, there's the possibility that between each different position, uh, the geometry of the detector, the, the, the tank itself might slightly deform. Um, there might be very slight changes to the positions of things. And so we want to be able to measure that as precisely as possible uh, in situ du during, uh, uh, during uh, data taking. And so this will work by having a, a system of cameras which allows us to perform photogrammetry, which reconstructs the full 3D geometry using stereoscopic uh, reconstruction uh, by basically taking photos of the detector from multiple different positions uh, in, in, inside the detector, either by having it lit up externally or using uh, LEDs which are mounted on the multi-PMT modules. By taking photos from multiple positions, you can then reconstruct the 3D geometry and get uh, the precision of within a few millimeters. That's uh, so on the next slide. Yeah, and so um, in order to really make the, the most use of the data coming out of this detector, uh, particularly with the new uh, photosensor hardware, uh, we're developing new machine learning reconstruction tools. Um, and this so far has already provides uh, improved resolutions in, in the reconstruction of say the, the energies uh, and the positions and the directions of the particles. Um, and uh, even more importantly, we're actually able to get much better um, particle identification performance from this machine learning uh, reconstruction. So compared to traditional reconstruction, we get improvements in um, classifying electrons versus muons or electrons versus uh, neutral pions, which decay to two gammas. Um, but we're also able to do something that hasn't been possible before in water sharing cloth detectors, and that's uh, to distinguish electrons from gammas themselves. Uh, although it's only statistical separation, uh, this will be important in the IWCD to get a better handle on uh, entering gamma backgrounds and uh, gammas from neutral current interactions of the neutrinos. Uh, another thing that will be important for the IWCD uh, in the reconstruction side is being able to separate multiple rings uh, or multiple events when we have pileup events. Um, and this is something that we're also working on uh, machine learning tools to, uh, to be able to do that. And so on the next slide. Yeah, so uh, to summarize, Hypercamacandy is currently under construction. Uh, we plan to take data in 2027. Uh, the IWCD will provide critical measurements for controlling the systematic uncertainties at Hyper-K, in particular for the search for CP violation in, in the lepton sector. Uh, the vertically moving detector allows it to span off axis angles, giving us the ability to measure neutrino cross sections for the different energy spectra. Uh, we've developed new multi-PMT photosensor hardware and new calibration systems uh, to enable precision measurements in a smaller water sharing club detector than has previously been possible. And by using machine learning reconstruction techniques, we'll be able to maximize the potential of the detector uh, by really making the, use, making the most use possible out of the data coming out. Uh, so the intermediate sector is now moving towards uh, the completion of the design uh, ready for the construction phase. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, I, now I think I probably need to stop the sharing in order that I can see whether there are any questions. Um, uh, are there any uh, questions for uh, Nick's presentation? Uh, maybe I can ask Nick. Um, so with the addition of this um, IWCD, is the NEAR detector itself still needed? Yeah, so they, um, they are complementary complementary in a way. Uh, so the IWCD will really be focusing on measuring uh, specifically the sort of neutrino interactions on water uh, using the same target, uh, water target and using the same uh, detector technology. But the uh, 280 meter detector is, it has much uh, more granularity to actually measure exactly what's going on in these neutrino interactions. So you get, um, you get complementary uh, measurements of the, of the cross sections, you're able to measure different intera neutrino interaction modes, um, and that will feed into better modeling of the neutrino interactions, which we don't currently have brilliant modeling of, um, and help us to understand what's happening in the far detector. Okay, many thanks. Okay, and uh, Gordon has a uh, question. Yeah, um, that was a very nice talk. I had a question about the 
I think it was mentioned a little bit earlier on the slides, either the near detector or the intermediate detector that you were able to move it up or down and measure uh, the beam at different angles and sort of reconstruct what you might expect at the fire detector. How do you know what angles you're using or sort of what composition of the different angles you need in order to model what you see at the fire detector? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, we're partly limited by uh, which positions we'll be able to do, in, like what will be feasible. Uh, so we wouldn't be able to say, take an arbitrary amount of measurement at every single position uh, within that, uh, within the range of, of, of angles that the detector will be able to measure. So based on what we um, will be able to take, which will probably be uh, doing several runs at a smaller number of different positions within the min between the minimum and maximum, we will then try to take linear combinations that uh, that ma maximize the similarity between the sort of integrated uh, energy spectrum of the of the different neutrino uh, neutrinos coming in and the expected fire detector. Um, there's studies underway to actually work out how to optimize this, how to do this in the best way. Uh, but basically, it's just a case of trying to add the, you start off with the um, position that's sort of most similar to what you want to get. And then you take your other positions and start to add them or subtract them uh, in order to incrementally make it as close, closer and closer to the, the spectrum that you want. Okay. Many thanks. Um, and. Uh... Uh, are there any uh, further questions for Nick? Maybe I, I can ask Nick. So um, uh, you said that um, start of running is meant to be 2027. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, for hyper for the fire detector. That's for the fire detector. Okay, so for the IWCD, what time scale do you expect it to be ready on? Yeah, so it's um, it. We would hope that it would start running before the start of the fire detector. Actually, um, it's the the time scale for the IWCD is is less uh, set in stone than the fire detector, um, but we would hope that um, with this water shank of test experiment that I mentioned before, that will hopefully be taking data next year, and that will give us um, the our experience with that will will lead into the experience to construct the IWCD, which we would hope would happen. Uh, also, starting to construct the the, the multi PMTs and do the mass production of that starting next year um, but it will take several uh, it will take several years to dig the pit and, and construct the detector itself yeah um, but exactly. moment, that's quite, uh, quite a challenging time scale for um for uh for, from the design through to what looks like quite a challenging detector actually yeah but we are still hoping that it would uh, start taking data before the start of ipk if possible okay okay um good to hear that um, okay, are, are there any um, final comments to Nick or any final comments for the session? If not, may I thank uh, all the speakers again, um, and um, we restart tomorrow at nine o'clock uh, UK time uh, with a further parallel session. Um, so many thanks again, everybody.